years back, I was in a meeting with some Thai people. And there's a Thai lay meditation teacher who was listening on a talk I was giving. I was talking about the Eightfold Path. And he objected to the idea that right concentration had to be jhana. He said there were two types of right concentration, the right concentration in jhana and the right concentration in vipassana. He said, saying that right concentration has to be jhana is simply dealing with pradyati tama, the dharma that's memorized and the dharma that's put into words, whereas the realization that there was a separate kind of right concentration, that was something that came from the practice. I later mentioned this to John Suat, and his comment was, well, the fact that he says that, that turns it into pradyati dharma, too. That's also a memorized dharma, dharma put into words. So it's important that you realize that whatever you hear as dharma is dharma in words. You can't take the practice out and put it right on the, on the table. Or put it on a tape. Right or wrong, it's memorized dharma. You have to supply all the other elements. The talk gives you views, which can be right or wrong. And as the Buddha says, the, one of the factors that can spark right view in, in yourself is hearing the voice of another person who teaches appropriate attention. One of the factors that can get in the way of right view, get in the way of right practice, is hearing someone who teaches inappropriate attention or explains things wrongly. But all the other factors have to depend on you. In other words, the dharma you want is not just the dharma of words, it's the dharma of qualities in the mind that you want to develop. And the right view is one of these qualities. And so you have to learn how to listen to the dharma, to recognize what's genuine dharma and what's not. Part of that comes from being widely read, and part of it comes from your own practice, learning to recognize what works and what doesn't work in your own practice. But everything else, from right reason to right concentration, that's totally your contribution. You have to make sure that all the factors are there. Say with right resolve, the resolve for renunciation, the resolve for non-ill will, the resolve for non-cruelty. You have to have all three factors present. If you want to be on the path, renunciation seems, means looking at any sensual passion that comes up in the mind and learning how to say no to it. It's not that you're going to go totally without sensual pleasures, and there's no way you can live in the human realm without some sensual pleasures. They're bound to be here. Simply being out here in the in the forest, even though it's hot, there's still a lot of pleasure in being in a quiet place, having trees around you. Now, the sensuality that you're asked to renounce is the sensuality of your passion for sitting around thinking about the sensual pleasures you would like to have, things you'd like to see, things you'd like to hear, things you'd like to smell, taste, touch. You have to recognize those, those desires and your passion for those desires. This is one of the most interesting parts of the Buddhist teaching on the topic of sensuality. He realized, he realized that it's not so much we're attached to things or the sensual contact as we are attached to our fascination with thinking about these things. Planning these things and then going over the sensual pleasures after they're over. 
the mind can spend days, weeks, months, years commenting to itself on this kind of stuff. Whereas the pleasures themselves are pretty fleeting. But we try to milk as much satisfaction and gratification out of them by our constant commentary on them. And this, we have to realize, is where we drag the mind down. If this is the kind of stuff that you're fascinated with, the kind of stuff you're fixated on, then pleasure and pain become the big issues in life. And the issue of purifying the mind, and the issue of finding the happiness that comes from a trained mind gets pushed off to the side. So the places where you have to make a choice, what kind of happiness are you going to look for? Are you going to go for the sensory stuff, sensual stuff? Or are you going to go for a higher level of happiness? You have to make a choice. Most of us don't like to make the choice. We'd like to have our cake and eat it, too. The only kind of cake you can do that with, you eat it, and then you've got what comes out the other side. So you've got to choose. What do you want? The Human Potential Movement years back told us that we could have every excellence, every potential fulfilled, and that human happiness lay in trying to fulfill all your potentials, your potential for sensual pleasures, your potential for a spiritual life, your potential for political power, for wealth, physical fitness, everything. And what did it do? It drove people crazy, trying to excel in every area of their lives. Forgetting the fact that we have limited time, limited energy, and we have to make choices. Some pleasures are more worthwhile than others, and some pleasures get in the way of finding other levels of happiness. And so it's a large part of maturity to see that that's true, and to make the right choices. That's one of the parts of the path that you have to provide. Another part is non-ill will. Or stated in a more positive way, goodwill. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for all the people around you, all the beings around you. And this, again, forces you to make choices in terms of the happiness you're looking for. Because if the happiness you want is harmful to yourself or harmful to others, it's not going to last. Which means, again, that you have to be choosy about the happiness you, you go for. You want a happiness that doesn't harm anybody, a happiness that you can live with for long periods of time, and a happiness that other people will be happy to have you live with for long periods of time. It's interesting that for many of us, the goodwill for ourselves is one of the hardest parts of this. And the corollary to that is when we realize that we haven't been showing goodwill to ourselves, we can also be very immature in the ways we decide to give ourselves little presents, give ourselves a little reward. And often it's precisely the pleasures that we, we really ought to be outgrowing. You have to think hard about the happiness you're looking for, and about how you can't really live for any length of time without some happiness. And you have to honor your desire for happiness. There's a large part of society which gets into our own psychological makeup that says you've got to deny yourself happiness for the sake of other people. And that gets so ingrained. That we feel embarrassed about the idea of wishing ourselves well. 
Other people, of course, totally resist that message from society, and all they can think about is gratifying any little desire that comes up. Both attitudes lead to suffering. You have to honor your desire for happiness, but you want it to be true happiness. Happiness doesn't turn on you, happiness that doesn't turn on anybody else. And the last factor of right resolve is non-cruelty or non-harmfulness. This corresponds to compassion. When you see that there's something causing you to suffer, you want to do something about it. If you see something causing other people to suffer, and if you can help them, you want to do something about it. If you can't help them, you have to develop equanimity. And the same for yourself. There's some areas where you can't change the conditions of your life that are causing hardship. But you can learn how not to suffer because of them. So you develop equanimity for the conditions you can't change, and you focus your compassion on the areas where you can make a change. And again, it's important to have wise, mature compassion for yourself. Help yourself in ways that really do advance the cause of true happiness. So if you find that the path is getting dry, things aren't working, then you might want to stop and look at this factor of, of the path, right resolve, to make sure that you understand what we're here for. We're here to honor our desire for true happiness. So the Buddha's teachings are all about. If you're serious about true happiness, this is what he offers you, a path of practice, developing the dharma of these qualities in the mind. So that you understand that this is where true happiness comes from. It's from the qualities of the mind and not from having things outside arranged in a particular way. Once you have that understanding and you act on it, you resolve that you really do want to find true happiness, you want to honor your desire for true happiness, and you're going to be very scrupulous and thoughtful about how you look for happiness. You would think that people would pay a lot more attention to what causes true happiness as opposed to false happiness. And yet so many people just go running for the false happiness. Everyone wants happiness, which is why you think that they would think seriously about it. That's one of the great ironies of life. People see somebody else doing something, hey, that looks good, that sounds good, and they just go for it. Without really ser seriously thinking about what kind of happiness would provide true satisfaction. So the Buddha offers us a right view. to help us understand what the causes of true happiness are. But as for the other elements of the path, and particularly starting with right resolve, those are things that we have to provide. It's that quality of mind, the maturity of mind, and our determination and our effort All these things, those are the qualities that make the path whole. So the Dharma does appear, not only to the mind, but as the Buddha says in some passages, that you ultimately get to touch the Dharma with your body. In other words, it's a total experience. It's not mediated by the senses or the aggregates or any of those activities. At that point, you can let go of the path. You don't need right view anymore, because you've got the happiness that, that more than more than, satisfi more than satisfies the desires for happiness you've had all along.